Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed education like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq everywhere like such as and I believe that they should uh, our education over here in the US should help the US or, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much South Carolina. I show the Miss Teen South Carolina video for two key reasons. First off, uh, we have this misconception about geography, uh, this kind of stereotypical view that it's going around learning about countries, uh, learning about where rivers are, uh, learning where the Iraq is and like such as. Uh, but it, I hope through the course of this semester, and in particular this podcast, uh, we learn that it's much more than that. Secondly, if we think about uh, you know, overall United States compared to other countries, we're very geo-illiterate. And that video really showcased that. What that means is we, uh, compared to others, have less geographical knowledge or awareness. Uh, so we have all these connections to the world, uh, but we really don't know what those connections mean, where they come from, and what's going on in those particular places. Uh, and so that's hopefully something that maybe not so much you, but maybe another person uh, I'm hoping can benefit uh, from this course. Uh, in this particular vodcast. I show this map here. This isn't really too important. All it is is there's a ton of individual political geography terms that describe countries throughout much of the world. All I'm saying is there's a ton of individual key terms that we would learn in a higher level geography course, in a political geography course, but we're going to focus this on the main themes. And so the idea here is even individual countries have many times their individual characteristics that make it unique uh, politically. Uh, when we think about it at the global level. Uh, before we begin, there's three often confused terms, and these often confused terms I want us to kind of be able to differentiate. Uh, first off, country. Country is just purely a vast area of land. That's its, it, that's its real definition. Uh, but we also, when we say the word country, uh, we're also saying the word state. Uh, and so a state is just any area, any territory, that is ruled over by a particular political unit. And so in a sense, the United States is one state, and we already know this. It's the Secretary of State, uh, whoever that might be at the time. Uh, so we have the idea of a state and country are often synonymous, pretty much uh, interchangeable terms. And so when I use the term state, don't just strictly think of it as being the uni you know, a particular state in the United States. Uh, Canada is a state. Uh, United Kingdom is a state. Russia is a state. Uh, and so we're going to use that term often, and so I just want to make sure we're clear, uh, clear on that. Uh, thirdly, nation. Uh, nation is a self-defined cultural, uh, often ethnicity, or social community. And so for you biology people, I think there's what, kingdom, phylum, class, order, something, something, family, speech, I don't know. But that big grouping, as far as grouping of living things on Earth, we've got our big groupings, reptiles, uh, uh, amphibians, uh, mammals, uh, so those are the big groupings. When we think about cultural groups or cultures, oftentimes the nation is the biggest grouping of a particular culture. So it's the, the, the highest order, the kingdom, uh, so to speak, for you biologists. And the thing with the nation is a nation and a state aren't the same thing. And so in some cases you're going to find a state that has within it multiple nations. And oftentimes that's where we're going to see some conflict. Uh, so we're going to come back and use these terms throughout the rest of this podcast. I want to make sure we know what we're talking about uh, when I use these key terms. Here's a map of the world. Uh, we see latitude, longitude, but other than that, you don't see any artificial or human-created things. Uh, so boundaries, some relate to physical boundaries. We'll, get a, we'll talk more about that. But the idea of a border or a boundary is a human-created thing. Uh, so it's a key term, key thing we're going to use uh, in one of these earlier video lectures. Uh, during 1940, there were only about 50 countries or 50 states in the entire world. Today, there are 193 member countries or member states of the United Nations. Now, essentially, there's more countries than that, but we're just going to use that number. 
So we've gone from 50 to 193 states in the world over the last 60, 70 years. And so in your lifetime, we're going to continue to see more states being created, more states being added to this 193 number. And so this is going to be something that's going to be very relevant to you uh, going forward because you're going to see this happening right before your eyes on the nightly news. Further, uh, the whole idea of a state, the whole idea of this is my territory, over there that's your territory, it's a relatively new idea. And so the evolution of a state we can trace for the most part from the Middle East and Europe uh, historically. Uh, so the idea of a state, the evolution of a state, uh, the evolution of the idea of dividing the world into independent states is a recent phenomenon. So before the 1800s, the key thing as far as the whole idea of a state was these city-states. And this we still see today. Uh, and so what is a city-state? What is the definition of a city-state? It's a rule over an area in which that rule is a city and a state. So the idea here is a city is also a state. Uh, examples, Singapore, Vatican City are examples of individual states that are only a city uh, as far as their size. Uh, in early Europe, in early uh, uh, Middle East, there's tons of these. Uh, so the idea of a state, we could trace back to these early city-states, some of those still exist, and so this is not like an archaic term, city-state. Um, typically these early ones, these early city-states, good examples of them throughout Italy. Uh, and so these early city-states were very compact and they had a wall around it. And then all surrounding that wall, out in the hinterlands, out in the rural areas, was agricultural areas that would help serve that city, that urban core. Uh, so these early city-states were typically walled, and there's several examples of these, like I said, throughout much of Europe. However, the idea of a city-state origins are Mesopotamia. So if you remember from your history classes, uh, they talked about that, uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, later on, the idea of a state really takes hold there in Europe. Uh, so we're going to see the origins of a state really take hold in Europe and then via colonialism especially uh, migrate to new areas. This here is Pompeii. I know we probably can't see this that well, but here is the wall that surrounds the city and then the hinterland outside there. Pompeii is right next to this uh, Mount, Mount Vesuvius, uh, this volcano. And so one of the things is Pompeii, this is a bad story, uh, so if you don't like bad stories, close your ears. Uh, but essentially, uh, the, much of the town was buried alive from this volcano that exploded and buried much of this town uh, alive. There's been a lot of books about this. Um, why I show this is because of that volcanic ash covering this entire city, over time, anthropologists, archaeologists, geographers have come back to this area, removed the ash, and we can see what a walled city would look like, especially one that hasn't been dealt with as far as conflicts since then, knocked down, vandalized, and all of that. And so we've learned about this early origins of a city-state, for example, from a natural disaster. States from the 1400s to 1960s. Uh, so now we're going to move more to the current time. Uh, so like I said, Europe started to organize itself into individual states. Uh, so we know these states today in many respects, the France, uh, the sorry, French speak, uh, sorry, in France they speak French, in Spain they speak Spanish, in Portugal they speak Portuguese, and so guess what? Uh, where those individual languages were spoken, they became their own states. Uh, so the evolution of states we can trace back uh, a big time there in Europe. Then, with colonization, which is something we'll talk about later in this particular video lecture series, uh, colonization then helped to spread the idea of, this is my territory, over there is your territory. So colonialism spread that idea to new places. And so we're going to see that diffusion to new areas uh, pop up and understanding why after 1960s did we see a ton of states being added uh, to that total we talked about earlier. Uh, so anywhere from the 18th to 20th centuries we saw this, and pretty much what it is is rivalries really fuel this, uh, this whole idea of colonialism, and so France and, uh, and, and the British, French and the British, they've always been rivals. They're like Yankees and Red Sox, Bears and Packers fans, Purdue and IU fans, they've always kind of never really gotten along. And so whenever one does something, the other does something uh, kind of counteracted. So as one country goes uh, and colonizes a particular area, guess who's fallen right after? And so that really helped to kickstart colonialism. It will come back and tell that a story a little bit later on. 
uh, but the UK and French helped, France started to help this spread that idea of a state to new areas. And so it's very important, this is a key term, key fact, key characteristic, key thing, just basically get this stuck in the head, and that's the idea of a state, the idea of a political unit that's different than another political unit, it's a recent term, recent phenomenon that helped to diffuse via European colonialism. All right, geopolitics. What are we going to do in uh, the rest of this particular vodcast series when we study geopolitics? Uh, the thing about geopolitics, every on the nightly news, whether it's CNN or Fox News or uh, whatever's in between, uh, or, or, or John Stewart show, or, or heck, the nightly news, you hear this term geopolitics all the time. And so that's something that's obviously very near and dear to our geographer's heart, something that we definitely try uh, to understand more about, and especially as it's becoming a term used uh, by uh, more and more other people outside of geography, especially popular culture. What are we going to do with geopolitics? What are we going to do in this particular video lecture series is we're going to try to understand how does, it, how does a new state come to be. In the, earlier I talked about how we got these new states that are going to be added in your lifetime. How does one happen? How does one, can I just all of a sudden the state of Andy? Can I go and set, you know, all of a sudden create my own state? Uh, you know, maybe I could, uh, but there's a set of rules that, to, that we're going to talk about here uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so we're going to understand the formation of countries and states. Key to that is the understanding of boundaries. Uh, so we're trying to try to understand different characteristics, different types of boundaries, uh, and how those boundaries may lead or may not lead to conflict. Further, we're going to look at global alliances. And so earlier this semester, I talked about globalization. Uh, and so part, a key part of globalization is these regional or global alliances. For instance, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, uh, the, um, uh, all kinds of the World Wildlife Federation. Uh, and so there's all these global alliances in which countries come together, uh, they share ideas, and it's a new thing. And so we're going to try to understand a little bit more about that as well. Further, key to this is we're going to understand why conflict occurs where it does. Why can we, at the end of this semester, at the end of this video lecture, we're going to be able to predict where conflict is going to occur uh, going forward. Uh, so we're going to look at those key cultural, but also physical factors that are very much lead, are leading characteristics, or leading factors to conflict, and try to understand why it occurs where it does. Uh, so in the future, you're going to hear about the Ukraine, for example. The Ukraine, I can guarantee you, is going to have conflict going forward. Uh, and so key to understanding that is there's some physical but key cultural differences within this country or the state of the Ukraine. Uh, so these are some of the key terms, key things we're going to look at in this particular video lecture series.